Welcome to the Yin Seminar Series. I'm Ed Kaplan from the Operations Research Group at the Management School, and I have the pleasure today of uh, introducing our distinguished visitor, Anna Nagorny from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And one of the things about Anna, you remember then when UPS used to have all of these uh, ads of the forum, what can Brown do for you? Well, they, they, you know, Anna would be a good person to tell you what Brown can do for you because all of her <laughs> academic degrees are from Brown University. Uh, she's a triple threat. She's, she started out uh, in applied mathematics, but at the same time, she was studying Russian literature and language and uh, did quite well in both fields. She continued in applied mathematics into her graduate work and culminated with her PhD in operations research, working with Stella DeFermos, who graduated from Brown in 83, at which point she made a night's nice move up and across to uh, Amherst, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. uh, where she's been ever since. And she has done remarkable work in organizing the operations research management science program up there. In 2000, she started their virtual center for super networks. So I think that gives her the distinction of having one of the older network centers mm -hmm. so defined. Um, Anna has applied network ideas in a dizzying array of applications. She started off in transportation. She did a lot of work in variational, variational inequalities and in finding network equilibrium. I'm sure we'll hear some of that. Uh, but, but she's gone off and worked on networks in supply chains, in, in, in healthcare, in all sorts of other areas, in communications. You know, some of which are familiar to folks here, but others which I think we probably haven't heard much of before. So I'm going to stop talking at this point and, and let the note of the network take over. <laughs> so Anna, welcome to Yale. We're delighted to have you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's fantastic to be here. This is actually the first time that I'm setting foot at Yale. So it's a very memorable occasion for me. And it's uh, especially wonderful that I can be speaking at the Yale Institute for Network Science. As you can see, after that wonderful introduction, networks have always been my passion. So today, I hope to share with you some of the applications that we've been studying and also show you some of the methodologies that we've been using to address complex issues associated with supply chains in numerous different kinds of applications. But before I begin, I'd like to very much thank those who invited me here. It's a pleasure to be here, and also I'd like to acknowledge students and collaborators without whom research wouldn't be so engaging, rewarding, and so much fun. Now, where would we be without our funding? And uh, Professor Kaplan mentioned that I've spent a lot of time at Brown and also a lot of time at UMass Amherst, but because of various wonderful funding and agencies, including, for example, the Fulbright Program, I've been able to also be at various other institutions for example, at uh, University of Innsbruck in Austria, at Kataha in Stockholm, at the University of Gothenburg, at Harvard, at Brown, and so on. I get my muse through travel, which makes a lot of sense because my passion is really transportation and logistics. Now, this is just to challenge you. I'm not sure I'll even get over, maybe be able to cover maybe two thirds of it. But in any event, these slides will be made available for you because I really believe in multidisciplinarity. I mean, I'm a big proponent, as our wonderful INFORMS president and Kaplan is, of the field of operations research. And operations research is necessarily multidisciplinary. So in a lot of work that uh, we do, we work with electrical and computer engineers, we work with computer scientists, we've even been advising medical doctors. And I'll be sharing some of the research uh, today with you. But let me begin. Background and motivation. I would argue that supply chains are actually a critical infrastructure. Okay? They're essential for the production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services in our global network economy. And if we look at supply chains, this is something I really want to instill a passion for you in today, uh, you're dealing with all sorts of different decision makers. We can have, for example, different suppliers that are providing inputs into production processes. We'll have different manufacturers. There'll be distribution center operators that are involved, warehouse providers, freight service providers, and ultimately retailers and consumers. So here is a graphic of a supply chain. And supply chains, they could be local, they could be regional, national, or global in character. 
and different products, as we'll be showing, will have different peculiarities when it comes to their characteristics. And these kind of peculiarities are challenging from a modeling point of view and also a great deal of fun to try and capture and analyze. So here, think about your absolutely favorite product. Behind your favorite product is going to be a supply chain. We will be talking a little bit about food here. We'll be talking about energy. We'll be talking about pharmaceuticals, as well as medical and nuclear supply chains. But other kinds of supply chains also are extremely relevant. You think about the clothes that you're wearing, right? The toys that your children, nephews, and nieces play with. And also here, something that I hope, if I have time to touch on, uh, and this is a totally other kind of domain. We work not only on profit maximizing kinds of supply chains, but also on supply chains for NGOs. That is a passion of mine. I teach a course now in humanitarian logistics and healthcare, and I think some of the toughest problems are actually in those kinds of supply chains. And also, there are supply chains in nature okay, that we've been addressing as well. So pick your favorite kind of product, your favorite kind of application. You can throw yourselves, immerse yourselves in these kinds of applications, and your students can as well. Now, I'm arguing that supply chains are networks. And supply chains in today's globalized economy have actually many of the characteristics of networks surrounding our modern societies and economies. We're dealing with a large scale nature. You think of, for example, a smartphone. There are hundreds of thousands of demand points around the world for a smartphone. Right? So it's very, very large scale. We look at also congestion. That's another big, big factor now in terms of not only our transportation networks, our telecommunication networks, but also in terms of our supply chains. In the Northeast, for example, we have a freight capacity crisis, which affects the delivery of various goods. And that's something that is really, really challenging. Also, we look at, for example, that there could be different kinds of behaviors associated with supply chains and network systems as well that I'm going to be focusing on today as well that can lead to paradoxical behavior. So how we model, how we manage supply chains is very, very important, but you have to capture the behavior of the decision makers involved, otherwise you'll be making poor decisions. Okay? So that's very, very critical. Also, as Professor Kaplan mentioned, I founded actually just before 9-11, because I wrote a book, Super Networks, actually decision making for the information age that was actually the galleys were in the JFK airport when the towers got struck. Okay, so, but I had the prescience to address that it's not just networks per se, but how networks interact with networks or, or super networks. It's really, really important. And obviously, we're living now in an era of a great deal of uncertainty and fragility. So that's really important. And decisions we make about networks will have impacts politically, socially, and economically. So here, how do we approach these supply chains? We are approaching them as complex network systems. Okay? We'll be talking about different kinds of flows. We're interested, for example, not only in the product flows, we're interested in financial flows, information flows, and so on. Okay? So here, how do we represent supply chains? When we think about a supply chain, okay, I think of you have to abstract things. So what are going to be the nodes? What are going to be the links? What are going to be the various paths? And the advantages of providing a network formalism are many. You can see different similarities, which I'll be showing you today in terms of supply chain structures, in terms of different applications. You can also see the different differences. Also, uh, when we talk about network models, we're interested in capturing you know, what are going to be the cost on the links? What are going to be, say, the profits? Do we deal with risk, for example? Are we dealing with uncertainty and so on? And if you can essentially identify network structure in a problem, then you can also exploit very powerful algorithmic methodologies. That's something we're very, very interested in. It's not just good enough to be able to develop a beautiful, elegant, gorgeous mathematical model of a network problem. You have to be able to solve it. Otherwise, policymakers won't be listening to you. You can address important issues of sensitivity analysis and so on. So we care about the soup to nuts. Okay, and we try and train and educate our students. It's important to model. It's important to do the qualitative analysis. It's important to do the good algorithms and solve problems using 
good data that you can get. Okay, so the graphical approach is very, very, I think, powerful, and it's something decision makers appreciate because it's very visual, it's very graphical. Okay, so here, since uh, Professor Kaplan mentioned actually transportation, I want to show you just one idea how we go from one kind of application to another kind of application. A few years ago, we developed a supply chain network model consisting of multiple decision makers on different tiers. Okay, so the top tier of decision makers would consist of, say, manufacturers associated with the nodes, and they'd be interested in they're competing with one another trying to determine the optimal production quantities. But the retailers, for example, they have to cooperate with the manufacturers because the manufacturers ship the goods. If the retailers don't accept them, you know, nothing's going to happen. You won't really have a supply chain. So it's very important to get the pricing uh, correct as well. And ultimately, you have consumers who look at the prices associated with the retailers, right? And they also look at like individual transaction costs. How much does it cost them to actually get the goods and so on? So you get these beautiful equilibrium models where you model, say, the decision-making behavior of the various decision-makers associated with the notes. Who would think that that supply chain network equilibrium problem could actually be reformulated and solved as a transportation network equilibrium problem? Okay, this is something that we showed. You can construct an abstract network or super network consisting of a super node and as many demand points as there are, for example, uh, demand markets. And with appropriate identification, you can get not only, say, link flow information, but also path flow information. Okay? And here, for example, this is another model that we worked on, and it was very multidisciplinary with engineers and actually economists, uh, in which we had a multi-tiered layered network and also a multi-level network. Okay, this had to do with dynamics of logistical, informational, and financial level flows. And also, since I'm speaking at Yale, I would be remiss not to actually mention a very classical book in which there are still problems which haven't been solved, although the book was published in 1956. The name of the book is Studies in the Economics of Transportation. It was co-authored by Professor Martin Beckman, who's on my doctoral dissertation committee at Brown, uh, McGuire, and Winston. And on the 50th anniversary of this landmark publication, we hosted a special festschrift at an informs conference in San Francisco. Only two of actually the original authors of the book were alive at that point. That's Martin Beckman, who's 91 and still going strong. Okay. And in the book, there were various issues raised. For example, they hypothesized that electrical power generation distribution networks could actually be reformulated as transportation network equilibrium problems. And we were able to show actually both McGuire and Winston that indeed we could reformulate electric power generation distribution networks and solve them, and I'll show you how kind of uh, we have been doing that, as congested urban transportation network equilibrium problems. Now, associated with this special fest drift, uh, actually the director of the Coles Foundation presented uh, plaques to the two living, actually, authors of this landmark uh, book in economics and also in operations research. And it was a fantastic, fantastic event. Okay. Also, there have been issues raised. Well, how does money flow? Okay. Does money flow like water or electricity? See, in the kinds of networks that I study, I'm not just interested in like who's connected to whom, the topological characteristics. I'm interested in actually the behavior on the networks, and that results in various flows. Okay, so how does money flow? Cohen asked a very important question. Uh, we were able to show in a paper, actually, that in a financial network model with intermediation and even electronic transactions, that model could be reformulated, again, as a congested transportation network equilibrium problems where there would be a single demand node okay, and solved as such. And moreover, as I had mentioned, we were able to show that electric power generation and distribution networks can be reformulated and solved as transportation network equilibrium problems. So that enables us to bring 
all these methodological tools that were developed for challenging large-scale transportation network problems to bear on problems in finance and also in electrical engineering and power engineering. Okay, so here, what about supply chains now? Supply chains have been around the term about, I'd say, 20 years. Uh, these are some of the books that I've written on supply chain networks, which actually they're related supply chain networks. And the Sustainable Transportation Networks book was published when Al Gore was vice president, and he actually wrote me a really nice letter thanking me for writing that book, which is great. Okay. So here, let me show you some of the supply chains. Okay. But my focus is going to be a little bit more from like the transportation okay, side. Because I really think if you can tackle a lot of problems in transportation, a lot of the other problems tend to be easy. And this is, think about traffic around the world, okay? It could be really, really bad. I always ask my students, what is your worst transportation experience, okay? Uh, which cities have, like, the worst congestion and so on? Some cities around the world, uh, traffic, obviously, rules aren't even obeyed or adhered to. Okay, so when we think about transportation, and this is going back to like Beckman, McGuire, and Winston, and even wardrobes, two principles of travel behavior, we think about, for example, you might have decentralized decision-making behavior or selfish behavior. For example, each of you had to decide on your optimal route to get to Yale this morning, right? And your optimal route and probably mode of transportation to get home tonight. So you're each acting independently. It's a large-scale Nash equilibrium game. On the other hand, we have centralized decision-making behavior, or that would be, for example, when, say, you can control a freight network, for example, and you know the origin destination pairs, you might know the travel demands, and you're trying to route the traffic in the network, so say you minimize the total cost to society. So we have user-optimized behavior versus system-optimized behavior. And these terms were actually coined by Stella DeFermos in a paper with her dissertation advisor, uh, Sparrow, published in 1969. And these were statements due to wardrobe. And what is beautiful about these statements is that we can formulate them mathematically. And these problems have also generated a lot of developments in terms of math. Uh, methodologies, which is really, really important. Because you see problems out there which you can't address using existing methodologies, so you have to go and develop new methodologies. And that's really, really exciting. Okay, so for example, that first statement there is a statement of user-optimized behavior, saying XP star will be the flow on a path. We say flows on paths connecting an origin destination pair will be positive, or those routes will actually be used if all use paths have equal and minimal user travel costs. If you find a better way of getting to work, you will switch your behavior. And this kind of adjustment process happens over time until no one can improve upon his own situation. And a user-optimized or traffic network equilibrium pattern has been established. On the other hand, when it comes to system-optimized behavior, that's kind of easy. You have a centralized decision maker, a single objective function, subject to the same conservation of flow equations as under user optimization, but you want to minimize the total cost. So following Karush and Tucker conditions, you have that you will have positive flow on a particular path if the marginals of the total cost are minimal for those paths connecting a particular origin destination pair. And obviously, in most networks, these kinds of flow patterns yield, yield totally different solutions. So we have ways of going around these. We can impose, for example, t uh, tolls and so on. So people behave individually in a way that's also optimal from a societal perspective. But it's very important to know how these networks are being managed and used. So let me show you who is now familiar with the Bryce Paradox. OK, if you, I'm going to go quick, and then I'll show you uh, some extensions, actually. This was a classic paper written in German. OK, Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Anyone understand German? In 1968, we had a single origin node one, a single destination node four. There are two different paths that travelers can take. Okay? They can take path P1, consisting of links A and C, path P2, consisting of links B and T. B and D associated with these links are certain user travel cost functions, which can also correspond to like time functions, which are a function of the congestion on the link. So the user cost on link A is 10 times 
f of a, that will be the volume of traffic on link a, user cost on link b is the volume of flow on link b plus 50, and so on. And you can see that, for example, the cost on A is the same as the cost on D, and similarly the cost on B is the same as the cost on C. So if you're operating under selfish behavior, you're trying to get to work as fast as possible, and assuming that we have, say, six units of travel demand per unit time, going from node one to node four, the travelers will disperse themselves, so they want us to minimize the travel cost. So it is pretty clear that three will be using path P1, consisting of links A, C, three will be using path P2, consisting of links B and D, and the travel time will be 83, so you think of it like 83 minutes, okay? No one has any incentive to switch a path, okay? If you do, it's gonna take longer than 83 minutes. Now, let's suppose you add a new link, and that will be link E, so, and that creates a new path for travelers. So everyone has a new choice now, right? You can take path P1, of course, path P2, Path P3 consists of links A, E, and D. And let's suppose that the link travel cost on link E is Fe plus 10. We have no change in travel demand. The demand is still six vehicles per uh, a unit time. So how will the travelers distribute themselves? There'll be two on path P1, two on path P2, two on path P3. But what happens is everyone is worse off in the network. Before it took like 83 minutes to get to work, now it's taking travelers 92 minutes to take to work, even though you gave them another choice. Okay? This would never happen under system optimizing behavior. Only it can happen under user optimizing behavior. Now, we had the pleasure of actually inviting Professor Dietrich Bryce to the UMass campus. We were the first ones to ever invite him to speak on the Bryce Paradox, which he had published in 1968, and he came to visit us in 2005. We were approached by him to translate the article from German to English because there were many computer scientists that were fascinated by the Bryce Paradox, because it can occur not just in transportation networks, but also, for example, on the internet and other kinds of complex network systems. So we translated the article and wrote a foreword also, uh, and this was published in the Informs Journal of Transportation Science, which was very exciting. At that point in time, I had a doctoral student, Tina Wackelbinger, from Vienna, Austria, so that also helped in the translation. And Bryce needed someone who knew the transportation uh, language, uh, obviously at the time, and also being pretty fluent in German, which I'm pretty good, not perfect. So it was very, very exciting to do that. And he spent about a week with us, actually, on the UMass Amherst campus. It was fantastic. So if you look at Bryce Paradox around the world, you can see kind of the inverse. There are places in various cities where they're actually digging up the major roads, okay, which I think is really, really exciting. So these are some of my favorite examples. Uh, for example, it happened in Stuttgart, Germany, Earth Day, okay, they closed 42nd Street, no one complained, okay, amazing. At that time, the director of transportation actually had a PhD in transportation from Lehigh, so that might have helped. And also, this is probably one of the most dramatic examples in Seoul, Korea. A huge uh, billion dollar roadway was actually dug up and the original river resurrected and green space and people are very, very happy. Actually, travel, uh, travel time has been reduced, it hasn't uh, increased, and also the environmental air quality has greatly improved. Now, some of you might know Mayor Bloomberg, former mayor of New York City. I thought he was really, really exciting and fascinating. Uh, a couple of years ago, actually, in 2009, he did something really, really risky. He decided to close a part of Broadway, okay, from 42nd Street to 47th Street. So we have Bryce on Broadway, and actually, based on uh, traffic data and taxi data, travel time has not worsened. And I always say the Bryce paradox can actually take you to Broadway. Okay, I was approached a few years ago. This is Yul Quone, a winner of Survivor. I don't know how many of you watch Survivor. Uh, to be interviewed, and actually it's on uh, the PBS broadcast, and it's on the video, actually on their website as well. America Revealed is a special series focusing on transportation, food, and energy. So this took four hours of videotaping in mid-March on 42nd Street. It was 
frigid. They told me to wear a suit. I, I, it was like 11 degrees, but it was a fantastic experience. And actually, in the interview, we talked about not only Bryce on Broadway, for example, but also Bryce in basketball. Okay, it keeps on being discovered in different kinds of settings, which is really, really fun. Okay? Never happens in System Optimized Network. Now, what about the following? And this is a question that was raised by some of my students. What happens if the demand varies? In the classical Bryce Paradox Network, for example, the demand is six. What if demand is lower? What if demand is higher? Over you know, different times of the day, the demand can change. So what we did is, for example, we addressed this problem using evolutionary variational inequalities, which are time-dependent, actually, variational inequalities. I was on a, uh, actually, wonderful fellowship. I was a science fellow at Harvard in 2005, 2006. And together with David Park, as some of you might know, he's a computer scientist. Actually, he's dean of computer science now at Harvard, and a collaborator, Patricia Daniel. We wrote a paper that examined that question. And what we were able to show is that at low levels of travel demand, okay, only the new path is used, and Bryce paradox never occurs. Bryce paradox only occurs in a certain range of demand. It's like 2.58 up to 8 and 8 ninths. And then ultimately, Bryce paradox never occurs okay, at higher levels of demand. So it only occurs in a certain uh, range of demand. And then it's almost like a wisdom of crowd phenomenon happening, happening as the demand gets higher and higher. It's just the two original paths are used. Okay? And travel time does not go up, okay? which is very, very cool. Okay? So also, as I mentioned, other kinds of network systems behave like congested urban transportation networks the internet, and also electric power networks. Now, what about time? Okay, this is supposed to be not only about supply chains, but also a talk about time. Okay, I'm sure all of you are pressed for time. Okay? You all have limited budget constraints when it comes to time. You're trying to maximize and do the best that you can within a certain time. But also, time is a huge competitive advantage, okay? especially now with these new technologies and Amazon and Amazon Prime and Google Prime. But also, time is becoming a strategy as important as other kinds of strategies. Okay? So uh, in October, I had the pleasure of being one of 34 faculty invited out to Amazon in Seattle at their first supply chain optimization conference, where we did a lot of brainstorming and offered Amazon a lot of advice. Uh, we got to see their one of their fabulous fulfillment centers, which reminded me of like a congested urban transportation network, except it was moving well. Okay, it was fantastic. We didn't get to see the drones, but I hope someday actually to actually play around with these drones. Okay, so time. Okay, some very famous people have emphasized time, and here. And I'd like to show you okay, time in the context of different kinds of products. For example, perishable products. Okay? This is something that's a real passion of mine. Because food is perishable, a lot of medicines are perishable, and even other kinds of products are perishable. So when it comes to time, you have to worry about transportation and storage. You have to worry about inventory management in these perishable product supply chains. Uh, you have to worry about the demand management and so on. Okay, which is really important. So how do we formulate and solve these complex okay, network problems? We use what is known as variational inequality theory. Okay. <laughs> We've been using both finite dimensional variational inequality theory and even infinite dimensional variational inequality theory, which we did with Parkes and Danielle. And what you need to do is essentially determine, say, a vector of strategies. Say vector x, you have a feasible set k that the strategies have to satisfy, and you have a function f that enters the variational equality that will capture the behavior. For example, in congested urban transportation networks, we can have vector f will be all the different path costs associated with the different routes in the transportation network. And this is actually has a really nice geometric interpretation. And moreover, what is really great about variational equality is it contains a special case as many of the classical problems in mathematical programming that we really care about, like systems of equations, optimization problems, uh, complementarity problems. And also, it's related to, for example, fixed point problems, which is really, really great. Okay? 
And so therefore, it's like a natural tool for formulating and solving different kinds of supply chain network problems operating under either decentralized behavior or, say, centralized behavior. And this is a geometric rendition of a variational equality problem. So here we capture like equilibria, okay? But at the same time, aren't we interested also in dynamics? Like what happens before an equilibrium is achieved? How do the decision makers, for example, interact over space and time? So in order to uh, be able to uh, identify decision-making behavior prior to, say, the achievement of an equilibrium state, we developed a new class of dynamical systems known as projected dynamical systems. In operations research, economics, and so on, we're always dealing with constraints, right? We have budget constraints, time constraints, non-negativity constraints, and so on. But in classical dynamical systems, there weren't really any methodologies to handle constraints, okay? Think of a dynamical system as like x dot equals minus f of x. But so how do we do that? So uh, we developed a theory with Paul Dupuy and also with a former student of mine, uh, actually Ding Zhang. And so you can have, say, an initial point, say, satisfying the constraints. And these projected dynamical systems guarantee that the trajectory always remains with the f within the feasible set. And it converges, actually, to an equilibrium point, which satisfies the associated finite dimensional and variational equality problem. So that means all these problems which we've been formulating and solving as variation equality problems now have a natural underlying kind of tantamount process, which is really, really nice. And I always think uh, your methodology is as good as, you know, is being used in other kinds of fields, okay? Can it help in other kinds of fields? Well, projected dynamical systems have been used a lot in economics now, for example, in population games. Uh, Bill Sandom published a book at, uh, with MIT Press on the topic. We've done a lot of work in, like, ecological networks, uh, supply chains. And I think what's really, really fascinating uh, that we've also had for example, projected dynamical systems being used in neuroscience, because really the brain is a network. Okay, so that is quite exciting. Okay, so let me show you some of the presentation actually today is actually based on uh, results reported in a book that we published in 2013, Networks Against Time, Supply Chain Analytics for Perishable Products. So let me begin. I'll begin first uh, with overviewing a few optimization models, and then I'll present some game theory models. So one of the applications that we have been working on, actually, with the Red Cross is that of blood supply chains, which is a very, very fascinating uh, problem because it's, uh, blood is so perishable. And it's so high in demand. And sometimes you can forecast the demand if you have like regularly scheduled surgeries. If there's some sort of a special trauma event, you really can't, for example. And the thing is, in the US, the blood supply, uh, it was OK. And now there are shortages being reported because actually in many parts of the country, because of the winter and so on, and people just haven't been donating. So, and a lot of times, blood supply is close to running out, okay? And then you can't schedule surgeries, okay? So it's a huge, huge issue. And you think of blood, you can't produce it, okay? People have to donate it. So when it comes to a supply chain, there's risk associated, okay? Well, the students come and donate blood if you set it up, for example, at the campus center and so on. Okay, and for example, if you look at high, highly perishable, platelets only last about five days, and red, red blood cells only about 42 days. Okay, and you also have to do the testing, and now even testing has to be done for the Zika virus, so it becomes extremely challenging. So this is a supply chain, for example, for the Red Cross, it's kind of centralized, okay, it's controlled, so it's operating under a system-optimized behavior. Uh, they have various testing labs, and they were closing a couple uh, around the country, so we were interested in investigating that. There are component labs, there are storage facilities, there are distribution centers, and ultimately demand points. And associated with those links, there'll be costs, there'll be risk, and a certain percentage of the blood usually gets discarded. Okay, on the link. So you might start with a certain amount, but ultimately at the demand points, you might have much, much less, depending on how the testing goes and so on, and also the time issue. Okay, so you see uh, our model handles waste disposal, because that's the cost thing. It handles the risk. 
it handles the uncertainty at the demand points and um, even uh, obviously risk associated with procurement. Okay, so that's one kind of healthcare application that's system optimized. Another kind of, uh, I think, truly fascinating supply chain that we were the first actually to model is that of medical nuclear supply chains. Okay, I like working, for example, on problems where you can actually get real data here. You can actually get the physics of it, the chemistry of it, because you have, you're dealing with radioisotopes that decay over time, so you know the half-life. Okay, so this is like really beat the clock. It's extremely, extremely challenging. Now, uh, these radioisotopes, essentially molybdenum gets radioactivated and it gets converted to what is known as technetium and it gets injected into patients. Okay? And it's uh, very important for cardiac procedures and also for cancer diagnostic procedures. Now, what makes this supply chain so challenging is that, okay, we do it via generalized networks and so on, you have complexity, you have economic issues, you have uh, this, it's only 66 days is the half-life of technetium, and moreover, there are only about 12 places around the globe where you can actually irradiate this technetium. And there are tens of thousands of these procedures that have to be done in the U.S., okay, every, every day, okay, so very, very challenging. And actually now in the U.S. we primarily use uh, the radiated uh, technetium that comes from one nuclear reactor in Canada, it's close to Ottawa, and it's 40 to 50 years old, okay, and it's been breaking down. Okay? And even when it comes to the transportation of it, it's known as hazmat transportation because it's radioactive, and that's actually highly enrich uranium. Okay, so it's a very, very scary situation. Okay, so uh, we went about modeling it and did case studies. Okay, and you can see there are only a few places around the world okay, and where you can actually do the processing and the generating and so on. Okay, so here, okay, 40 to 50 years old, okay, all sorts of challenges and only about a dozen places around the globe. Okay, so how do we do this? Okay. Luckily now, through actually Congress and so on, there's been a lot of push to be able to have a facility in the U.S. where you can actually produce these products, for example, because they're, they're so essential for uh, medical diagnostics. And at the University of Missouri, they just recently started uh, a nuclear facility to be irradiating technetium. It's not yet fully approved, but so that might actually take some of the stress uh, away from this, but still, it's a big, big challenge. And you can see another kind of supply chain topology. And what happens here, for example, is you get the radiation, okay, at a facility, for example, in Ottawa, you get hazmat transportation, because it's nuclear, okay, and so on. You have to extract it, you have to do further transportation, then you have to manufacture generators, which actually we're doing in Bellarica, Massachusetts, only a few places in the U.S. capable of doing that. Ultimate transportation, and at the various medical facilities, you do what is known as elucidation, like you actually remove it and actually shoot it, okay, inject it into the people. Okay, so it's a very, very complex, uh, actually, supply chain. Uh, when we did, we wrote a couple of papers on this topic, we were actually appro uh, approached by the OECD, and they were shocked that we were able to do this. Okay, but you can get a lot of the data online, okay, which is really, really important. And moreover, you have decay associated with the links, and it's time decay. Okay, so in these kinds of perishable product supply chain problems, we're using generalized networks to model how, say, you begin with a certain volume, as a certain origin node, and then as it proceeds down the links, according to a certain path in the supply chain, you get less and less of it, okay? So that's how we capture, and here you can get actually uh, the physics expressions, which is really, really nice. Okay, so here, what about another kind of perishable product supply chain? And uh, this is one which was inspired by Beckham, McGuire, and Winston. How about electric power supply chains? Okay, we're all living okay, in the same 
uh, part of the U.S., New England, and actually we had, for example, also a congestion crisis, for example, in terms of electric power in Connecticut. Okay, now they're working on trying to improve the transmission lines and so on, but we're, there were real big concerns. Uh, this is work that we did using uh, data from the ISO New England facility. We have the independent system operator based in Holyoke, Mass., which is very close to Amherst, Massachusetts. And we worked on all these different states, for example. And we had data for the hottest month reported to date, which is July 2006. We had hourly data, price data. We had the different fuel compositions and so on. And this becomes the network topology. So it was a real life economic engineering empirical kind of application where we had the different fuel mixes, we had the different transmission providers, the actual, uh, all the engineering integrated, and the different demand markets for the different regions. Okay? And you can get the data, the loads, the demand. Cyrus, how are you? Okay, I hear you love remotes. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> you should be at the Westminster Dog Show. I guess they didn't pick you. Okay, next year, next year. So uh, the model actually had 20,000 variables, and we captured the behavior of the various decision makers. Okay, it was very, very complex. And we were able to reproduce the prices almost exactly by capturing the behavior, okay, which is really nice because then you can do sensitivity analysis. You can see, okay, what happens if the price of natural gas goes up? What if the price of the oil goes up and so on, okay? So, still with me, okay? We depend on energy, right? Very, very important. And I hope you've all had a wonderful lunch. We also depend on food. I think students run on food. So do faculty, but food is also a highly perishable product. And if you look at the shelf life of food, it's amazing how some of the foods, if you just keep them on, you know, outs on, in your pantry, for example, they will spoil in a few days, for example, if they're not refrigerated. Okay? At the same time, when you think of you know, where we're getting the produce now, we're getting <laughs> cherries, for example, and blueberries from Chile okay, in, the, in the middle of winter. But uh, one of the big issues that we have in the U.S., for example, is that a lot of the food that is being transported is actually being discarded, okay, because it's not arriving in good enough form. And it's been estimated that one out of the seven truckloads in the U.S. is actually discarded, okay. It's being wasted, so we really care about the quality issues. And in terms of food, there are also actual chemical formulas that what can apply that are a function of time that show you the deterioration of quality, okay, which is really, really cool. Okay. So we developed a model, and it was published in the European Journal of Operational Research, where you have, say, for example, different uh, fresh produce producers, they're competing, for example, and they have like products that are differentiated, essentially, by their brand. And you have perishability associated with the links. So you will have, for example, transportation links. You will have uh, distribution links. You can have different technologies. See, when you look at a network, different links could represent, for example, different modes of transportation. They could represent different technologies associated with storing, uh, for example, in distribution centers, and so on. And associated with the links are also those arc multipliers, okay, to capture the perishability. So here we have different formula associated with perishability, whether you have like first order kinetics for certain fruits and vegetables or zero order kinetics for our other fruits and vegetables. And we can actually track. And when I show you a pharmaceutical model, we'll show you exactly the expressions that we use to track how much volume you actually have left uh, once it moves down a path in the supply chain and reaches a particular demand point. Okay. So what about pharmaceuticals? Okay, this, so this is an industry that I think is fascinating. Okay, just, and also one that really behooves and needs more optimization, I would say, and much, much better models. Uh, if you look at the data, for example, look at uh, the costs, okay? How much actually is being spent on medicines in the US? It, it's huge, okay? It's, it's hundreds of billions of dollars a year. And the numbers aren't going down. But at the same time, I don't know if you've read, this was very recently, at, oops, I think at the end of January. I'm not the technology expert, but pardon me? Get back. Oh, Get back. Now it's gone. 
Now it's gone. It's totally gone. Well, I can still talk. Oh, it's back. Okay. Uh, at the end of January, New York Times had a special report about uh, the shortages of various pharmaceutical drugs in the U.S., which I found to be absolutely horrific, which, I mean, I've been working on it, but, uh, and also the fact that there are doctors that have to be rationing medicines in various hospitals now. To me, that is horrible. Okay? I spent a lot of time in Sweden. I ask always when I'm in Sweden, like, do you have drug shortages? Do you have? No, we don't have drug shortages. We don't have medicinal. So why do we have such problems in the U.S. when it comes to drug shortages? So you actually have to be rationing medicines. And oftentimes patients aren't even told, okay, which is pretty, pretty bad. I think that's horrible. So there have been many cases over the past, say, decade or so, especially of, say, perishable product issues when it came to pharmaceuticals. There have been lots Lots of instances where there have been so many of the pharmaceuticals that have been spoiled, for example, they've been past their expiration date, we have problems with quality, and so on. So uh, big, big issues, for example, and that's actually the study in, in the U.S., um, actually reported by the New York Times. And the number of medicines that are in short supply are, are horrible and very, very important medicines. These are, some of these are life-saving <coughs> medicines. So you wonder, why is this happening in the U.S.? Okay, this is something that really, really kind of bothers us. Uh, the FDA is trying to figure out, okay, maybe we could start identifying potential shortages earlier. You know, maybe we can uh, work on the quality issues as well, okay, because that's another big scenario. And the thing is, in terms of quality, I don't know if you realize, but most of the ingredients for pharmaceutical products, actually, that are produced in the U.S. come from foreign countries, okay? Another thing is about 75% of the generic drugs in the U.S. actually are produced either in India or China. And sometimes there isn't as good quality control there. A lot of times our inspectors will inspect manufacturing plants there maybe only once a decade, okay? And in the U.S., typically, they would inspect maybe once every two years. So there have been some really horrible cases in terms of heparin and other kinds of drugs that not only do they not do what they're supposed to do, but they actually, they can cause injury or death, okay, which is really, really bad. And also we have a lot of issues in terms of waste and environmental impact. Okay, so uh, we became interested in the following issue. Um, Obviously, pharmaceutical firms are interested in making profits, okay? They're profit-maximizing entities or they can't exist. And a few years ago, some of the best-selling products were actually losing patent right protection, okay? For example, like Lipitor and Plavix. So we decided, okay, could we create a model and then investigate what would happen to prices and market share if we had, say, generic competition entering in? So this is what we did, and I will show you kind of uh, the model. And it was published, okay. And actually, we had challenges publishing this paper. At first, the referee said, oh, can't be, okay, it's impossible. Then we waited a few months, and they saw the real data reported in the news and newspapers and so on, and we responded, look, this is exactly what happened out there. I said, okay, paper is accepted, okay. And there's also something I want to tell students, don't give up. If you believe in something, George Akerlof, uh, the Nobel laureate in economics, his wife is actually Janet Yellen, head of the Fed, his uh, Nobel Prize winning paper was rejected three times at some quality and lemons. Okay. And it got published and he got the Nobel Prize for it. Okay, so never give up. Okay. That's the thing. So here we have, for example, the supply chain network topology. You have the different pharmaceutical firms, okay, at kind of the origin nodes. You have the different demand markets at the demand nodes. And they have different manufacturing plants associated with producing the product. Then there are different distribution centers and obviously transportation links between and ultimately uh, dissemination. Sometimes you might have direct links from the manufacturing plant. Sometimes you might be able to order directly actually uh, from the manufacturers. So that's how we represent that. And now here, so we have essentially each pharmaceutical firm controls its own supply chain. But they're going to be competing on the demand side, and they can actually complete, compete also on the supply side through the various cost functions associated with the links. Okay? 
And here we're going to be having decay, and those alpha A's are the arc multipliers. So you begin with a certain volume of flow on the link, F of A, and then you're left with an F A prime as you transit down because of perishability. And you can also then capture waste, okay, and associate a cost associated with the waste, which we do here. Now, we assume that uh, each pharmaceutical firm is strategizing and trying to determine the optimal pathways so that it maximizes its profits. Okay? And consumers will be interested in prices associated with the various firms, okay, and they can differ by demand market. Because sometimes you feel more confident if it's a branded pharmaceutical product, surveys have shown, and so on. So this expression five captures actually how much will be left a particular product once it's moved down the particular path of a supply chain. Okay, so that mu p, and you multiply these arc multipliers. Okay, so also we need to track how much is left uh, on each link. Okay, so we need that mu a p. And then we have our conservation of flow equations for links and obviously for demands too. We want to make sure that the demand is satisfied. But here the challenge is you'll probably have to produce more because you're losing some of okay, the product as it moves down the supply chain. And we have quite general demand price functions because we want to capture competition. So D is actually the vector of demand for the different pharmaceutical products associated uh, with different firms and uh, different demand markets. So here we also have cost functions on the links. And the strategy vectors are going to be the path flows for each su uh, supply chain network. And they're interested in maximizing the utility, which is the profit. So the first two terms capture uh, the profit or the revenue. And then you have the costs associated with operating various links and also the waste. Okay, those Z hat A terms are the waste. So we can gather all of the utility functions for all the firms into a vector, say U hat and you know, what you do uh, affects the other pharmaceutical firms and so on in terms of profits. So here we have a Nash equilibrium. Each one is trying to do as best as possible, subject to the decision-making and uh, behavior strategies of the other pharmaceutical firms. And they have their, obviously, conservation of flow equations. Mm -hmm. So under certain assumptions of, for example, continuity, uh, continuous differentiability, and also concavity, we have that uh, the Nash equilibrium is established if and only if the uh, path flow pattern actually satisfies the following variational inequality problem. Okay, so it's a single inequality that captures all the behavior. It's very, very elegant. Okay, and you have a feasible set, you have the strategies, and we have uh, very powerful algorithms to solve for these uh, kinds of problems. Okay, so we have, I expanded it. You can see you have the marginal cost, you have uh, you have the marginal revenue as well. And we can do path flow formulations. We can do link flow formulations. And we put these uh, actually expressions into standard variation quality form because the theorems are always in uh, standard variation quality form. And then let me show you how this is related to other models. And we'll show you how we've solved this. Okay, we have a new, a very cool algorithm. Okay, who would think that these kinds of perishable product supply chains, right, in pharmaceuticals are actually related to fast fashion? We were approached a few years ago by a team in Hong Kong saying, we really believe your work is relevant to fashion. I said, okay, why not? It sounds interesting. There are real time pressures. Some uh, firms are more successful than others. And you do compete essentially by brands. You have like H&M, you have Zara and so on. So here, if you have, say, you don't really have the perishability, all the arc multipliers are equal to one. Uh, and here, we're also interested in environmental issues. So we want to minimize waste. That model collapses to one that we did uh, for fashion supply chains. Okay, so that was really interesting. Also, we've mentioned that uh, we've done other kinds of applications, okay, which I've highlighted before. And also, uh, in the case of without the arc multipliers actually having fractional values, we've investigated mergers and acquisitions. Who would have thought that there's actually a merger paradox in economics? Okay, I'm fascinated by actually uh, paradoxes. And uh, essentially, we were able to show okay, when you might have it, when you might not have it. So here, you think about different kinds of firms. There's also now uh, so many mergers going on uh, in the indus in various industries, 
We've had quite a few in the airline industry. Now we're having a lot in beverage and telecommunications. And you can think of, well, does it make sense to merge or not? Okay, we can identify different synergies. And you think of it as kind of a super supply chain, for example, then you can have a super source node, figure out the synergies, say, before, and the synergies after, and see if you have a gain or not. Okay, so we can do a very simple perishable products uh, example. Uh, for, say, a pharmaceutical product. Say we have two firms, a single demand market, and we have identical, uh, like, paths, okay? Very, very clear. This one we're going to be able to solve exactly. We don't need an algorithm for it. We can handle fairly complex functions. We can have nonlinear, say, cost functions. Uh, we have arc multipliers, different demand price functions that are not separable because we want to capture the interactions and so on. And here we can do explicit expressions. And assuming that both paths will be used, we'll have positive flow, the uh, leftmost terms preceding those multiplication signs, we can set equal to zero. So we can solve it and become a simple system of equations. Okay? And we get the exact solutions. Okay? But obviously, one of the challenges of solving game theory problems in marriage and equalities is you don't know exactly which paths will have positive flows okay? and which will have zero flows. So that's why. We actually need algorithms, okay? So what is an algorithm? Uh, we actually, uh, for solving these oligopolistic uh, pharmaceutical uh, game theory problems, we apply an algorithm that is part of a general iterative scheme that we developed with Paul Dupuy. And essentially, it is, uh, tracks, it's like a discretization of a tantamount process. So at each iterative step, you figure out the path flows, Okay, of the various firms, then you update the information and you continue until you get the solution. Essentially, uh, the flow pattern hasn't changed much. Okay, so it's a projection type method, Euler method, with a varying step size. And we have uh, conditions for convergence. And what's really nice about it, it's very easy to implement. And you have closed form solutions at each step because the feasible set is actually the non-negative orthant. Okay, so what about some case studies? Here we're investigating this you know, patent right expiration. Uh, Lipitor, is, well, Pfizer is the main manufacturer. Then we have another competitor, say Mar Merck, which already has been doing some uh, generic, actually, production and so on. So we have, say, uh, the first pharmaceutical firm is Pfizer. The second one is Merck. Uh, we have two manufacturing facilities for each and three distribution centers, and we're looking at kind of three demand market points. We have uh, various demand price functions, and uh, we see the various data in terms of the cost functions and the waste functions, and we computed the solution, and you get the link flows, and we also get the path flows, and I'll be showing you some examples. And what we see here is, though, uh, Pfizer charges higher products at the demand. It still it captures the market essentially for the first demand market and the last demand market. So, and, and that's essentially, this was Pfizer's actually biggest selling product, okay? It was this huge profit maker for us. Obviously, they were really, really concerned about losing uh, patent protection. Okay, so here, and you can see the utilities, okay? Obviously, the profits are higher for uh, Pfizer. And then we decide, okay, what happens if we add a competitor? So say it could be like Rambaxi, for example, uh, which will be the one in the middle. It has uh, two manufacturing points, two distribution centers. And first, at first, uh, the demand price functions wouldn't change, okay, associated with, say, the first firms and the second firms' uh, products because people don't really know. It's only later they start changing. So these will be the demand price functions for the added competitor. And uh, we see what happens here. And what happens here, the first two firms, the demands don't change, the prices don't change because the data hasn't changed yet. But the third firm actually is gaining more, okay, and its prices are much lower. And then in case three, what we have happen now, the consumers have heard about this generic okay, choice. Actually, their doctors probably have too in terms of prescribing and so on. So you have the demand price functions depend also on the demand for the third pro uh, actually firm's product. And then we see what starts happening 
Now things start getting really interesting. For example, the second firm totally loses uh, the second demand market, and that's where it had actually a lot of business before, is 0.00. .00. Actually, Pfizer, uh, before it had like 66% of the market share, it drops to 33%, and a generic competitor uh, uh, has actually the majority. So, and this is actually what happened in reality, okay? So it's really, really interesting. And what happens typically when uh, a firm loses patent protection, that's why firms are so anxious about it, uh, they might lose as much as like 60 to 70, even 80% of the market share. Okay? So that's a big, big issue. So we're able to reproduce that, which I thought was really, really exciting. And you can see also in terms of path flow information, which is nice. So you can see how the strategies actually change okay? and see the dynamics actually. And this stabilizes pretty quickly in terms of the algorithm, okay? So this is a big one. I'm just going to give you a few highlights, okay? Because I know you're very, very interdisciplinary and you come from all sorts of different fields. So I've spoken a little bit about a perishable product supply chains from an optimization perspective, uh, from a game theory perspective. Uh, we've done a lot of other work related to supply chains and just to show you kind of the generality. Okay, so what about social networks? I know there are probably sociologists and you have this Yale Institute for Network Science. So we all love social networks. And this is something that fascinates me too. When you talk about transportation logistic networks, you can kind of see what's flowing, right? The vehicles, the products, and so on. What happens in social networks? What's flowing? Okay. Should we be capturing actually the time that people spend? Okay, should it be like relationship levels? What is it? The interactivity is something really, really interesting. So, uh, actually, with Tina Wackelbinger and um, another do former doctoral, s several students of mine, well, we became very interested in the integration of social networks with other network systems. For example, social networks with financial networks that I had mentioned, and also social networks with supply chains. And uh, one of the reasons that we were really interested also, and that even came later, is that when you had the financial crisis, for example, I was born in Canada. Canada didn't have the financial crisis, okay? But supposedly, the bankers uh, really work closely with their clients. They develop good relationships. So you would have like lower transaction costs as a function of relationships, and you know kind of your customers better, okay? So that became really, really interesting. So how we model these, for example, in both uh, financial networks and supply chain networks, and we even do the dynamic evolution, when it comes to relationships, uh, we care about the strength of relationships associated with the social networks. And you can invest, for example, in these relationships. So you have a certain, say, budget, or you spend a certain amount of money. And the more money you spend, the stronger the relationship is. And you can even see the evolution. And these are actually super networks. So there's interaction uh, between the networks with um, different kinds of flows. Okay? And also, we have been doing a lot of work, I mentioned, in terms of disasters. And there is really important uh, for us to be able to identify which are the most important nodes and links, because those are the ones you should really protect the most. Okay? If a certain bridge goes down, it might have the biggest impact on the economy, for example. And if you look at the number of disasters that we've endured okay, globally, you can see that they're huge. Okay? And the cost in terms of economic losses and loss of life and even environmental loss is really, really big. Okay? Of course, we have the Haiti earthquake, Katrina, uh, and so on, and the triple disaster okay, that we'll soon be marking, actually, the fifth anniversary of okay, in March and the blackout, Superstorm Sandy, okay? So it's big. So number of disasters are going, number of people affected by disasters. And like, how do you identify which are the most important nodes and links, okay? There are many different types of centrality measures, and contributors have come from different disciplines, from sociology, from um, physics, quite a few, and I'd say from transportation science, operations research, and management science. And you see, this is of global interest. Okay, so who's the most important, right, in an organization? Okay, for example, these are some of the measures. Okay, and which nodes and links really matter? We became very interested in this work, and essentially what we do is we use in many of these problems the user-optimized network equilibrium kind of framework. 
because that can be applied to transportation networks, electric power networks, financial networks, and certain supply chains. And essentially, we identified a certain performance measure of a network. Okay, that's that E. And we say a network performs better if essentially it can handle a higher demand for OD pair at a lower kind of travel disutility or price. Okay, so you sum over all the OD pairs. You have the demand D sub W, and that lambda W is actually the equilibrium kind of travel time or equilibrium cost. And you normalize it. You divide it by the number of OD pairs. So we have uh, this... Uh, efficiency measure then allows us to determine how important a different network component is. And we care about you know, how important a node is, for example, and ranking the nodes. How important is a link? Because sometimes when, say, a supply chain goes down, it might be a manufacturer, it might be a supplier, it might be a warehouse, it might be a transportation route, and so on. So you get an importance of a certain network component G is equal to the efficiency drop, okay? And you can rank. And I'll show you uh, how uh, we've applied this actually to, and actually others have applied uh, this measure around the world. And moreover, this measure is very useful because it can handle not only fixed demand network problems, it can handle elastic demand problems, it can handle dynamic <coughs> problems. Uh, it's uh, well defined. You don't have issues of disconnectedness. There are some measures, for example, that only can rank like nodes in terms of their importance. Some can only uh, rank links. We can do both. Okay. So here, uh, we That's apply. For example, most measures of power in the network don't have the notion of a process that will happen right. or any demand. Right. So one novelty is to use, assumes that there's some end goal. Exactly. Just, there's some performance. That, we have yeah. the economics there. We have the behavior there. We have the flow there. Because if something goes wrong, you can have a redistribution and so on, OK, so which is. Know, which, which then you say defining notion of importance with respect to, say, a certain end, desired end goal, like... Right, to the behavior. behavior. Right, exactly. Or, or, or an equilibrium. Or an equilibrium, oh, an equilibrium, oh, yeah. So uh, this was a transportation network uh, with Bureau of Public Road cost functions, and we were able to identify which are the most important links in the network, and there's some you don't even have to bother maintaining, okay, if this is done the commuting paper, because, right, commuting period, because who cares, okay? But the others, you better be working on them, okay? Fix those potholes, make sure, you know, they're not damaged by trees or electric power lines and so on. Okay, so... Uh, I also think your tool is only as good as how it's being applied by others. You shouldn't be the only one applying, uh, for example, your research. And we are pleased that it's actually been applied internationally. And uh, many are saying it's uh, really the way to go. Uh, it's been applied, for example, in Germany to identify the most important highways and so on in terms of the volume of traffic that they can handle. They're actually worried about earthquakes in Germany, which I didn't realize was an issue. It was also uh, applied in Dublin. You can think about where to invest as well okay, in terms of this measure to identify where they should put a new uh, metro route. Okay, so here, uh, another application, for example, in Germany. And uh, this is really interesting. There are major fires in Greece, for example, in 2007. It was like the worst fires they've ever had in Greece. And this measure was applied to identify the most important roads, okay? And then uh, see how the fires actually affected the most important roads. And this, I thought, was a very novel application just done recently in Indonesia, trying to determine which might be the better shipping routes, okay, from an economic perspective. Okay? Now, what about the Bryce paradox? Okay? If your measure makes sense, it should make sense there. And it became interesting because there are certain measures that actually identify that new link as being the most important. That's the one you should protect. Okay? So we've convinced a lot of people, no. Okay? So here, for example, notice that the link E, that new one, actually has a negative okay, uh, importance value. So that one you should probably just remove for that level of demand. And actually, this is even robust when we do the dynamic kind of variation. It works as well. You should get rid of it. Okay? And you can see which are the most important nodes uh, and the others. So what about disaster relief? That's something we've been doing a lot of work on as well. Uh, last summer, we organized, uh, fittingly, in Greece, not that we planned these things, a Dynamics of Disasters conference. And when we were there, the financial crisis hit there, and the ATMs didn't work, and we had limits, and the credit cards didn't work, and so on. 
but it was still, it was a fantastic conference. So uh, when we think about disaster relief, their time is a huge, huge issue. You have to deliver, for example, uh, the water, the food, the medicines within like 48 to 72 hours. And there you have, if it's an international thing, you worry about congestion on the tarmacs, in the, on the various transportation routes. You also worry about, for example, the time it takes to do the customs and the processing. So there are all these other issues and a great deal of uncertainty. Okay? And the links might be degraded because you've had an earthquake or tsunami you know, or what have you. So we have several papers actually now, actually quite a few, in this area uh, where we try to assist policymakers in making better decisions. Should you procure locally, for example, or say internationally? Uh, what are the relative benefits? Uh, should you pre be pre-storing your supplies or procuring more and what percentages? Okay. So here, I'm going to be ending in a few minutes. In less than a month, drum roll, I'm going to have uh, a new book coming out. It's a 400-page book on competing on supply chain quality. It's the second book in a supply chain series of Springer. Chris Tang of UCLA's Graduate School of Management is actually the series editor. And, and this is a book written with a former doctoral student of mine. Donnelly, and we're very, very excited about it because there we go and address all sorts of issues in terms of quality, okay? And the focus is in uh, pharmaceuticals, it's in high technology uh, products, and also in terms of food. Uh, there we're interested in issues of like information asymmetry, okay? Manufacturers might know what components the suppliers are actually giving them, okay? Or consumers might really not know, okay, what's in their products. You think of all these uh, horrific issues that we've had recently, for example, like Takata airbags, like other car, uh, automobile manufacturers, ignition switches, and so on. And there we've also uh, developed actually measures to identify which are the most important suppliers in terms of supply chains, okay, for particular products. So if something goes with them, okay, in terms of supply chain disruptions, it'll have the biggest effect on your supply chain. And we also do a lot of work with freight service provision and quality okay, as well. Okay, so summary and conclusions, I've given you highlights of some of our work. I'm taking you on a journey, I think, over many different kinds of applications. Uh, there's still so much that remains to be done, but I think this is a fantastic area to be working on. And I also believe there are great deals of synergies between supply chains and future internet architectures. Uh, we've had a big NSF grant, one of five teams in the country, working on the future internet architecture. And actually, the approaches that we're taking is kind of a supply chain perspective okay, to that. Okay? And we will be working a lot on issues of resiliency and robustness and um, also more work on food supply chains and even cybersecurity, which is another passion of us and of ours. And so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adam. We have a little bit of time. Mm. Is there any questions uh, from the audience? Mm. Anyone? Let, let me throw one out that I like to use to harass economists. Mm. So economists spend all their time telling me about equilibrium. Mm. And you told us about, there looked like some fairly involved work that you did to actually compute an equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So I always ask the economists, if, if someone has to think so hard to compute an equilibrium, why should we believe that we're ever seeing one in real life? And so like, if you're addressing what should happen with these pharmaceutical companies, why should we believe that what they're doing now is an equilibrium? Well, but equilibrium is like a benchmark. It's something that they strive towards. So that's kind of almost an idealized state. And you can see how far away they are from that kind of state. So that's really, really useful, actually. If you're interested in optimization, you should be definitely interested in equilibria because the real world involves multiple decision makers and not just a single decision maker. Uh, These models, of course, are more complicated, but often what happens in these equilibrium models is you don't have to think about the entire system in order to decide what your move is. The actual thinking you have to do might be quite local. Right. And so now what happens is 
you know, like one of the simplest economic equilibrium models is the Cobweb theorem, right? So this supply and demand just goes around and around and around, and, and it, it, it converges. And the people who are the players in this don't have to know anything about the mathematics of getting to an equilibrium. They just end up getting there right. uh, because they're following some very, very simple rules. So this, this, is, this is more complicated. I, I appreciate the question, actually, because I run into this a lot, too, uh, at the management school. But there's, you know, it's interesting. When you're talking with large companies, they do tend to be pretty sophisticated. So it's, not a, it's certainly a much better benchmark, I think, than to assume that you know, everybody just does the same thing and doesn't look at what other people do. But in a lot of places which are pretty sophisticated, I mean, just think about real-time pricing of airline tickets, road management. <coughs> Yeah, the airline companies who, you know, they're, they're changing their ticket prices all the time. What they're doing is they're constantly updating and they're updating on the basis of information. So I end up with what looks like an equilibrium model and it's very sophisticated, it, it, even though they're not necessarily solving it as, as a game. And electric power is equilibrium. The, the act of we solve it, we solve it, we solve it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I don't mean to critique, to criticize yeah. it. Either. No, 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 I love it. It's a good question. It's because I study algorithms for sure. the most part. Um, I've also sometimes had to explain to economists, you know, why we should care not just right. about the ideal algorithm, but, you but know, can, is can it reasonable, it? like you mentioned, tetonment is a process by which you can imagine people achieve equilibrium. Yeah. Uh, right? Actually, so hard to explain to last economists why year, I don't care about that. Dan, last year in my seminar on network version qualities and game theory, I had computer scientists in the class, and they believe that these methodologies will revolutionize machine learning. Okay, so. Isn't there a difference um, in like an oligopoly between um, optimization for one player and equilibrium yeah. for the yeah, rest yeah. of the exactly. market? Exactly, it's the right? competition. So, that's true. so I think that's what you're yeah. getting at is you're talking about equilibrium, but there's no such thing because the oligopoly wants optimi their optimization, right? But it's each one is optimized, but they're yeah, competing. Uh, they're and if you look at the algorithms, it's, it's like it's discrete time. Converge, perhaps. Uh, right. That's, right. That's because if you ignore what they're doing and the prices and so on, you're going to be in real trouble <coughs> if you don't deal with the market. And that's exactly what's it right. <laughs> right. So it's really important because you're competing for personnel, you're competing for goods, you're competing for market share, you're competing even for shelf space at stores. Well, you're, you're competing based on not equilibrium. Being based on optimizing something that yeah, but comes but you do that. Thing. You can think of it like the algorithm which I gave you. That's essentially a discrete time algorithm. Okay, you can think about okay, in one time period they check out what they're doing, and then they update and update until an equilibrium is achieved. And then the other uh, thing, there are aspects that are built in. I mean, if you take a look at what goes on in pricing, for example, you know, the, you, you're going to look at your demand not only as a function of your price, but you're also going to look at what the prices of competing products yeah, are, and that to. feeds into it. And so there's, there's a lot of that behavior which is built into these models. But you can't the argue model. that drug pricing is an equilibrium model. I'm just, no, right? no, no, no. What, what, what happens is two people who are doing to coming to come up with their optimal prices are going to take into, the, in, into account what the change in their price is going to do on consumers for the other part and vice versa. So what happens, again, in kind of a one-step way, these things will iterate. But in an oligopoly, you don't take into account what the other. There's no competing price, right? So there's no. You don't have. You don't have to worry about that. You're not feeding anything into it other than the fact that you're optimizing your own profit versus well, equilibrium. No, but you're, you're looking at the demand for the competitors. You're looking at demand for the you competitors. are, and you can do a price version too. But with the supply chain, there is no demand. For the right? but no, there is demand. Yeah, it's it's dynamic demand. Okay, the prices are a function of demand. And they're a function of not only demand for your products, but also for the others. Right. Okay, and the other demand markets, they could switch and go oh, to other no. demand markets. I can buy Lipitor, I can buy Simvastatin, I can buy Atorvastatin, whatever. They're, they're different, different things. And if, if one of the other companies changes its price, it's going to have a big effect yeah. on it. Then how, come you, how can U.S. drug prices be so different from Canada, for example, if they're well, that's, There's regulation involved there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's Canada. So so but this is U.S. space. That's why. That's what I'm saying. It's not optimization. It's not equilibrium. It's optimization. It's no, that. because it's competition. There's competition. So if it's competition, it can't be optimization unless you have a central controller. That's and they don't. Even if there was competition in the drug market. Uh, there are. You can see the, the prices yeah. change. Oh, it's huge competition. Well, we've got a whole course. Yeah, right. It's huge, huge, huge. <laughs> it's one of the most competitive 
Yeah, yeah. Except we don't compete against Canada. <laughs> price, yeah, right, 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 exactly. So some go to Canada to get their drugs and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Going once, going twice? Thanks, Anna. Thank you. Thank you.